The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Iowa. Welcome to Conversations from the Iowa Writers Workshop. I'm Keisha Lynn. ZZ Packer's talent was evident from an early age. First published at age 19, she received a bachelor's from Yale, a master's from John Hop Johns Hopkins University, and an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her debut short story collection, Drinking Coffee Elsewhere, received rave reviews from across the critical spectrum. Her awards include a Whiting Writers Award and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Her articles and essays have been appeared in numerous publications, and she will soon begin teaching at the University of Texas at Austin. CZ Packer, great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Keisha. Let me get this out of the way right now, because I know I'm like the millionth person to ask you this question. ZZ, where does that come from? Um, I, all I know is that my uncles pretty much had an early age, an age I can't even remember, you know, I, I think it was before I was even speaking, just began calling me ZZ. And, you know, in my family, everyone just ends up getting a nickname. My sister's nickname is Baby, although her actual name is Jamila. And my actual name is Zuena, but uh, I've just been called ZZ all my life. And actually, I only remember learning that my name was Zuena after being called ZZ for wow. a, a long time. Yeah, so it's just this, this the name you have, it's the name that stuck. Yeah, it yeah. is the name that stuck. Fantastic. I, as I was doing research for this interview, I found out that one thing that you and I have in common is that you, we both started out planning to be engineering majors. Yeah. Um, Talk about that a little bit. Well, when I was really little, I just loved doing all sorts of things with robots. Yeah. And, you know, I even wrote to Daniel Hillis, who was at MIT at the time. I don't know if he's still there. And he actually wrote back. He wrote this book called uh, The Connection Machine. And, and uh, strangely enough, as I was 12 reading it. I don't know why I was reading it, but I used to put together little robots and try to make them go across the floor and I tried to have robots that would clean up the room or whatever and they would, all they would end up doing is sweeping the floor. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I came up with the Roomba before the Roomba existed. Right, yeah. But um, <laughs> so I always thought this will be great to go, it'll be great to go into engineering. And once I decided not to go to uh, MIT, I kept thinking, well, at Yale, I'll just, I'll just go and do engineering at Yale. Mm -hmm. um, but the more classes I began to take, you know, I would think, oh my gosh, I'm just, you know, it's taking me every ounce of energy to get, you know, A's and B's on these problem sets. Mm -hmm. And I would do, um, you know, a paper for an English class in almost no time right. and do, you know, pretty well on it, you know. And so um, after a while, I think probably my junior year, I made the, the decision to actually just quit mm -hmm. trying to be a double E and uh, just be an English major. That is so funny, the exact same thing happened to me, because I started as an electrical engineering major, and then my senior year, I said, who am I kidding? You know, I took a creative writing workshop, mm -hmm. and it just kind of, I mean, I've been writing before, but then that's when I said, I'm gonna just go for this. But now, after this, you went to, you went to Johns Hopkins. Now, you were mm -hmm. in the writing program there? Yes, okay. so you get an MA, that you can get an MA in writing there. And it actually felt a little bit more like a literature degree yeah. than it did a writing degree. And even though I loved it, and it was, it was a great uh, experience to have that year. By the time that it was over, I kept feeling like, oh, this is it, it was just only one year. And so even though I wanted to go into an MFA program and really wanted to go to Iowa, I felt as though it was too soon to go right after right. Um, having been at Hopkins. So I taught in Baltimore for, I think, uh, three years, and then um, I was applying to Iowa, and when I got in, I just knew that I had to go. Oh, what was your experience like in Iowa? Uh, it was great. I mean, yeah. and when I first came here, it was a little awkward because, you know, I felt as though I was like pretty much one of the only people of color in the workshop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it just was, you know, it was very Midwestern. And my friend who helped me drive out here said, oh, they've got corn even at the gas station. There's like a stand <laughs> of corn right. um, as you come into town from uh, like on Dubuque Street. But um, so, but then... Everyone here was so amazingly friendly in the town itself, and yeah. the students were great. Um, the uh, the the actual students of the workshop were 
really good. And it was just so great to be with like-minded people. Right. Everyone had the same appreciation for literature. Right. So you felt immediately, even if some people might not become your you know, best buds or mm -hmm. anything like that, mm -hmm. that you had this very important thing in common with them. And so that went a long way. So I really loved it for those reasons. And even when I... Um, even when I finished the workshop, I stayed in Iowa City for a summer just because I, I loved it so much. Yeah. So I had a positive experience at the workshop. I would say that, you know, it was very interesting to have four different workshop leaders who were all right. amazingly different. So Frank Conroy, who, um, you know, has unfortunately passed on, right. he, he was just known as being the kind of almost like a drill sergeant. Right. And yeah. it was great, though, because I think a lot of writers come in, they're, they're very talented, and they uh, are told that they're talented, and then they get into the workshop, and they just that sort of validates their talent. And so then they have this very sort of writerly, this idea that they are yes. writers with That's a right. capital W, and they're artists with a capital A. And they take themselves a little too seriously. And uh, Frank made sure that everyone knew that it was about the work, right. that you had to put in the hours each day, that you had to be reading. You, and so it wasn't a sort of social art. It was a, an art that was rather uh, lonely and, and sometimes solipsistic, and, um, and that, but you had to put in the hours uh, at the at your desk, and um, just him saying that. I remember one time he's you know the, the very first time we met, and it was a, everyone was um, in the uh, the dye house mm -hmm. uh, in the I don't know what you'd call it the sort of front room. He said, "How many people here are writers?" Uh, and everyone raised their hand, and he said, "Well, why aren't you at home writing?" Ah. And then it was sort of like this. Well, <laughs> and so that was, his point was, you know, you more than anything, you should, you should be doing, doing the, work. the work. What are some of the other teachers that made an impact on you while you were at So, uh, definitely James Allen McPherson, who, I'm, who I just saw the, uh, uh, earlier today. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was fantastic because he was generous, not just in the sense that he would read your work and provide feedback, but it was generous in that he would place your work in the context of literature just from you know time memorial essentially, and so for him to talk about your work and compare it to Malraux or Flannery O'Connor or James Baldwin, he would say, "Oh, these are some of the themes that James Baldwin is dealing with," and and so he really sort of elevated you, um, and it's slightly different than the way Frank Conroy may have wanted to sort of get you down to the sort of brass tacks. Uh, McPherson was always sort of understanding it that you were part of literature, and what you were doing was trying to actually create literature. Mm -hmm. So um, it was very valuable for him to be able to draw on every single yeah, author that he drew upon, you know, for him to talk about. I remember one time he said um, he was talking about Balzac or something, and uh, someone said, well, you know, when you're growing up in, growing up in Georgia, I mean, how did you feel just you know, reading Balzac? And he said, you know, I knew that I was a, a black boy in Georgia, mm -hmm. but I could still read Balzac, I'm you know? Lottery, yeah, I yeah and, <laughs> and so, um, and he had this idea of universality. I think he inherited a lot of that from Ralph Ellison, who is his mentor, and uh, um, Albert, uh, uh, Murray. Albert Murray. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so this idea of the Omni-Americans and, and always trying to uh, recognize that no one should be left out of the American dream. So he felt the same way in terms of writing. So he welcomed everyone. I mean, he got Yi Young Lee her start yeah. and yeah. Um, really championed her. He championed me for a long time. And he doesn't ever tell you what he's doing. He mm -hmm. doesn't sort of announce himself. He just, you know, quietly, you know, works to get you this scholarship or for you to meet this person who he thinks would be valuable for your work. So he's been amazing. Marilyn Robinson has been uh, mm -hmm this great, um, just this mind yeah. to have. I mean, going into her Shakespeare and Milton seminars and just right. being privy to her, you know, her great genius yeah, has been it, yeah. w wonderful. And Stuart Dybeck was the visiting writer that I had, and he was fantastic. I still talk to him to this day. And he could take a story and he would sort of say, well, this is almost like an octagon story. And then he would just be able to describe wow. how it worked. And he just had seen so many stories, and it so dissected them that he, he provided some of the most amazing feedback ever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, very interestingly enough, and he would just, well, not interestingly enough, but he, he had this way about him. He kind of talked like a football coach. He's like, yeah. well, see what you need to do with the story here. <laughs> and he would then begin to, you know, perform a sort of thesis you know, on your story, and it was amazing.
Now talking about literature, I wanted to read the quote that opens up your collection of short stories, Drinking Coffee Elsewhere. I thought it was really interesting. Join me in the hope that this story of our people can help to alleviate the legacies of the fact that preponderantly the histories have been written by the winners. That is from Alex Haley's Roots. Why mm -hmm. that quote? Yeah, I think that, you know, when I was here in the workshop and just when I was just, you know, even before the workshop, just starting writing, I had this sort of idea that, you know, that you know, I'm writing these stories, and the stories are predominantly these, you know, African American and young African American characters, and that almost always when you see a story, it will start off with, you know, she walked down the street, and everyone assumes that the she is going to be white, and uh, not, you know, African American or not Chinese American, or whatever, and this idea that you have to kind of almost sort of erase that assumption. Uh, from the beginning already implies a little bit of work. So the, for me, you know, and I, I don't consider myself a, a protest writer or even a political writer, mm -hmm. but it does take on a sort of political edge in that you realize that what you're doing is you're trying to write from the point of view of the people who don't always win. And I don't even just mean the winners in terms of, you know, great battles or victories or anything sure, like that, sure. but the people, yeah. but just being able to get that sort of level of uh, uh, of um, to be able to take for granted that this is the person who's the she, yeah. this is the person who's the he, are the protagonist, unless otherwise named or unless otherwise el elucidated. And so that, you're already sort of starting out at a kind of disadvantage because you're, on the one hand, kind of, um, I, I won't say being didactic, but you're almost thrust in the role of educator, and your job really is to just tell the story. Yeah. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I kind of felt as though if I have that, the, the, um, the Alex Haley uh, quote, the people sort of understand the stance that I'm taking and where I'm coming right. from. Right, exactly. In terms right. of these characters. These stories, the eight stories that are in here, come from a wide variety. I mean, we have a lot of different characters in different situations. D do you find that, I, I mean, I've seen this happen, where people tend to assume that stories are autobiographical, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. Have you experienced that with these stories? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes people just sort of say, well, you know, it, well, when this happened to you, and I said, well, no, <laughs> it didn't happen to me. Right. You know? But I am I'm always uh, pleased in a sense because it means as though, it means the story has become real enough for them they can only assume that it must have happened, mm -hmm. you know, and that it must have happened to me. And so sometimes when I say, well, actually, you know, the, the pr person who's actually the closest to my experience, you know, would probably be the male narrator, mm -hmm. um, and they're really sort of surprised. But... I think that people have this yearning to want to, uh, to want to escape, and even when they escape, you know, they're escaping into a reality that they that they know or they uh, assume or they assemble. And I kind of think that um, that's why people have to assume that it's sort of autobiographical. So what I, one of the things I do, I do like to, just for the sake of verisimilitude, I like to make sure, I, I like revisiting, you know, places that I've live, you know, lived before, sure. or um, old experiences, but it doesn't mean that every experience has happened to right. me. So even though I'll have something that's said in Baltimore, you know, it, and I've lived in Baltimore, I think it makes the story richer because I know the streets and I know, you know, the particular flavor of that place. Mm -hmm. um, and so it makes it for a richer, more realistic story. But then people begin to think, oh, well, you, you know, if you were a teacher, then this happened to you, and you were slapped by a student. And they're like, no, 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 it's not quite that way. <laughs> but the reality of it, I mean, it's a, it, of course, in a way, it is a, it is a compliment to you. Yeah, and the yes. emotional truth, I mean, I think that the, the stories, for me, I strike more for a sort of emotional truth that, you know, I know how it would be to be, an, you know, angry about certain things or upset about certain things or in love in this particular way and to be, you know, have love thwarted. And, and those kinds of things are are true, whether or not the experiences were directly, you know, um, have a direct correlation with my life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, this book, Drinking Coffee Elsewhere, was it was a Penn Faulkner finalist, New York Times notable book, and it was chosen for the Today Show Book Club by none other than John Updike. Now, what was that like? Yeah, unfortunately, he passed away. Um, and um, yeah, but it was really amazing to just for someone of his stature to even for me to even be on his radar and yeah. for him to have noticed. So it was fantastic. And when I met him, he was very genial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, at one of the memorials, I talked about how, 
you know, I sort of introduced myself and I said, well, I'm ZZ Packer. I think he was shocked that I was a woman. He assumed I was a uh, guy. Yeah. And then, you know, he, he said, well, I'm orange. Yeah. And he'd had this, all this sort of pancake makeup that had been smeared on his face. It was all sort of this peach color. And it, immediately, so he just sort of opened with this joke and he's very funny. And um, we were on the Today Show with Katie Couric, who at that time was, you know, she was interviewing at the Today Show. And uh, she was amazingly bubbly. I mean, I couldn't believe how bubbly she was. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so afterwards, we were just sort of both sort of like almost at this sort of weird low level. And mm -hmm. Katie Crook was finally just sort of like, how does it feel to be the coolest writer in America? Oh. And um, <laughs> Updike just kind of took it all, all in stride. It was, it, was, it was very fun. Yeah, It was a yeah. fun experience, but also just an honor, really. Yeah, of course. I mean, this, this book had so much, pr I mean, there was just huge rave reviews for this. And you're just coming out of, these stories were published elsewhere. And then you mm -hmm. finally put this together in 2003. Mm -hmm. And it just got so much excitement behind it, right? Yeah. I, 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 well, sometimes people will say that, and, and I'm kind of surprised because I, I guess I just sort of think, oh, you know, I'm going about m my day doing, doing things work. and such. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and I'm not really thinking about, you know, the, the press it gets or any of that stuff. Sure. And, and the particular publisher that I was working with, Riverhead, they don't actually make it a point to go out and seek press. So they only do marketing by the way of, by way of, you know, if it's a review that comes out or something like that, and they'll have a tour or something like that. But so it's, it, it's always surprising to me. I, I always, I guess I think of it as less successful than other people think of it being. Yeah. I just kind of think of it, oh, there's my book. There's right. your book. There it is. But then between then and now, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, the, we know you've been working on the novel for a very long time. I'm going to ask about that in a second, but you also write a lot of articles. You have articles yeah. in many different places. Do you have an affinity for nonfiction versus fiction? Or well, um, you know, fiction is my first love. Yeah. I do think that I I was just sort of like stretching my mind, and I kind of think that writing nonfiction is you know just something that I've always wanted to do, but I've never um, you know I never pursued it in any kind of um, academic sense or any kind of uh, real way in terms of uh, you know going to school or taking classes or anything. So I would just you know. I just thought, oh, I'll, I'll write a piece in Salon because I had an opinion about the election. This was in 2004. And, um, and, you know, they would get published. So anytime I just sort of had a sort of strong opinion about something or I sort of felt as though I wanted to um, put something out in the world and write about it, I would just go ahead and, and do it and take it up as a project. Mm -hmm. So whether or not I'm good at it or not, I, I don't really, I mean, obviously I would like to be good at it. Yeah. But um, I just think it's a fun thing to do. And I just kind of like doing it. But I feel as though it's almost uh, uh, separate from, I mean, it's entirely separate from fiction. I mean, I don't even call it writing when I'm doing that. Really? I just sort of, yeah. like, I also say, I didn't really write today. And, and my husband will say, well, actually, you were writing a lot. And I say, oh, what I mean is I haven't written any fiction today. Right, right. So. fiction has a special place there. Let's talk about your novel, which I understand you finished. Yeah, I finished yes. the novel actually in August. Now, mm -hmm. I only got a chance to do uh, a third, um, to revise a third. But the mm -hmm. novel is uh, about the Buffalo, it's called The Thousands. Yeah. And it's about the Buffalo soldiers who are these um, infantry and cavalry units shortly after the Civil War. Um, and they ended up uh, fighting with the, the Native Americans, so on the plains, but also in the Southwest. And they were incredible warriors. Um, and they don't get talked about that often. I mean, people sort of know the Bob Marley song, and that's about it, the, right. the limit of their knowledge about them. But they were you know, given this really onerous task, I mean, just after emancipation, mm -hmm. after being um, you know, designated as free, um, then they essentially had to uh, put these Native Americans on two reservations. And at the very end, though, they actually ended up protecting the Native Americans and getting the white settlers who were encroaching upon uh, Oklahoma in the form of the boomers and Sooners uh, off of uh, Native American land. So right. it was a very long and varied history. I mean, I don't even get into what happened later with, you know, they were... Um, at Samuel Hill and such with, with Roosevelt right. and they did all right. of that stuff. Yes. But, you know, I concentrate mainly on what were the, no, what's known as the Indian campaigns. Sure. Um, and, you know, the West is so mythologized into this, 
you know, people just sort of believe that they're just cowboy, the cowboys and Indians, and they don't include in the history, you know, the Mexican American vaqueros and the black, you know, um, cavalry units. They don't include the black cowboys. They don't include like the Chinese railroad workers. And I mean, so all these people went into making the country, you know, what it is, right. for better or worse. I mean, a, a lot of it was really awful for the Native Americans, mm -hmm. and so, um, um, and you know, for uh, the African American, you know, men who still were treated awfully by all these towns that they were actually trying to, to they were trying to protect the townspeople, and these white white townspeople would drive them out of town, or um, you know, go to the forts and you know shoot at them, and so all sorts of just horrible stuff. But it's just this way of re of looking at. Um, this period of time right. in American history again. Yes, and, and again, telling a story mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't been told, mm -hmm. right? And that you know we are we are given a particular image of the West, and mm -hmm. now you're delving in and finding this other area. Um, I am so sorry we are out of time, but thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Keisha. This is Zizi Packer's debut short story collection. It's titled Drinking Coffee Elsewhere. She has a novel, The Thousands, coming out very soon. I'm Keisha Lynn. Thank you for joining us on Conversations from the Iowa Writers' Workshop. The preceding program was produced by the University of Iowa in association with the Big Ten Network.